on the other side of things, we're going to the uh, the other edge of the age spectrum, if you will, to a 19 year old that is now mm -hmm. in Barca's. Well, they say Barcelona Athletic, but I watched that a lot fr uh, preseason friendly. Mm -hmm. And the only hot take I had was the one that I expected to have after watching mm -hmm. him some with Racing Santander. And that is that Pablo Torre will be around the first team in some capacity this mm -hmm. season. I think that, of course, he'll be playing with Rafa Marquez, I think, for a bit before the first team figures out exactly what their rotations are and anything like that. But I know people said, you know, again, this is going to the extremes. Now people are like, oh, is he going to overtake Gabi? Or, uh, of course, he's going to take the starting spot from Frankie de Young. More on that in a second. But no, Pablo Torre is going to get minutes because he deserves minutes. Uh, it's one of those very, very comfortable, like, oh, what's the drop off when you would have put? I I've been smearing him this week, and I really feel bad about Ricky Puj. But what's the drop off <laughs> when you put Puj into the game? Well, now you have an example of a player that, unlike Puj, who couldn't be registered with the B team anymore uh, last season. Mm -hmm. He's going to be registered with the B team likely, and he's going to be called up to the first team for uh, for X number of games that he's allowed to play in. I believe the number is, I think it's 10 before you have to register him with mm -hmm. the first team I by so. January. So he'll make his appearances, likely playing with the B team, uh, and we could see him. I'm not sure if the Copa del Rey matches even count against that number. I think they do. So whatever it may be, they're going to figure this out. And and for all intents and purposes, somebody, maybe Frankie the Young, but somebody will likely have gotten hurt or you have questions come January. So I think mm -hmm. by January, you might even see him get registered for the first team because, you know, again, God forbid, Pedri goes down for any more amount of time or anything yeah. like that, right? Or any, any other player. You never know. So you have this player ready to go, you know, busting through the door. Because what I really liked about him, even in the preseason friendly, I saw the same thing in racing, racing Santander. What is he going to look like when the competition is higher? I'm not sure I'm too worried about that because the things that were good about Pablo Torre were good as him as an individual. What I mean by that, same thing with Frank Cassier. Cassier looked like a, a man amongst boys, not just physically, I just mean with the ball. Their one-touch yeah. passing, their spacing. With Pablo Torre, he could get out on the left wing, was combining well with Abde, and it wasn't even their moves. It wasn't even creating a goal-scoring opportunity. That pass up to Aubameyang through the middle in the first 10 minutes, mm. it, it, you know, it was fine, but he was also tasked to take the set pieces, which regardless of where he fits on the pecking order, the fact that Xavi chose him to take those set pieces in the yeah. second game does say a lot. And so it was, again, his, his decision-making, his first time passing, those were the things that are applicable no matter what, right? Like a player that is going to just play the first time ball immediately is going to play that first time ball, whether they're playing against Liverpool or whether they're playing against Olat. And it's the same thing with a player that's going to have to take that extra touch or have to, you know, it's one thing to dribble in space or dribble around these kind of, you know, again, fourth tier players. That's one yeah. thing. Again, so no disrespect to Abde. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to really take or extrapolate anything from Abde's you know, performance, right? If that makes any sense, right? Because he's he's playing against competition like a lot last season. And I expect him to be able to use his moves and dribble around those guys. But again, Pablo Torre, Frank Cassia, I was really, really, I don't say over the moon, but very optimistic about mm -hmm. how seamlessly they seem to fit into Xavi's system, regardless of the end results and regardless of their opposition. Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> this is where, you know, I kind of mentioned, I caught up on this game through whatever highlights I could find. I didn't actually see the entirety of the game. But what I did see in the highlights is a lot of what you're touching on. I mean, it's, you know, I, though it lacked a little bit of context, the the passing that you're talking about and the 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 single touches and the decisiveness, it seems innate with him. So kind of regardless of level, I mean, of course there are going to be you know, growing pains at various points as you, yeah. you know, he's only 19 and he's, you know, likely to be stepping up in class to some extent this season. And then, you know, assuming a reasonable amount of progress, probably a lot more next season. So, but I think the, it's kind of when you see traits, it's sort of, yeah, like it's scouting traits versus, versus production or, you know, um, the, the evidence is there that, yeah, like the the comfort on when I say comfort on the ball, but comfort kind of get the ball, give the ball, the the whole you know the, the old Guardiola thing. Like he that that seems to have been sort of seared into his brain to a, to a proper extent. And and I I do think it's interesting. I I didn't know so much the the set pieces thing, but when you said that about uh, Chabi giving him the the set pieces to take, um, you know, I mean, on the one hand, it can be easy to read sort of too much into it, you know, but. On the other hand, like Chavi's been around this club. He's been around what this 
is and how kind of gestures and small sort of things are immediately kind of placed under a micro, you know, a magnifying glass and, and overanalyzed. And yeah, I mean, by giving, by giving this kid the, the set pieces, I mean, he's kind of, he is saying that I, you know, I see something in this kid. Like he, it's, it's at least a small kind of gold star from, from the teacher. And, um, you know, it's something worth taking note of. I mean, I don't know if we can, it's something, you know, you don't want to put too much, you know, too much stock in it, but at the same time, it's, it's something, it's a positive indicator. Well, in the third part in that first half of that midfield trio mm-hmm. with Nico Gonzalez playing as the mm-hmm. pivot. And that was something that we heard rumors about. Mm-hmm. And so I think what is clear in that decision is that Xavi wants to give him the opportunity to audition for the backup pivot role, because mm-hmm. if Nico Gonzalez is a future pivot at Barcelona in a four, three, three, what that opens up for you, that opens up mm-hmm. a, in the future, you might not consider chaining to a three, four, three. If that in the future, that means that you don't have to be splashing 75 million on some kind of backup for Busquets. You might even bring in a player for competition for him. Mm. It, there's, there's so many future hypotheticals that get answered very easily by Nico. And one 45-minute preseason friendly, I know he's played pivot occasionally before, but not really for the first team. So I, there's really nothing I can say from that, right? He misplayed a ball in yeah. the 30th minute. I, and that was really what his only, we'll say, quote unquote, mistake on the ball. He also, uh, I, I thought defensively, he wasn't really where he needed to be when he was uh, on the counterattack. It, it's not that he was slow. It's just like his positioning was a bit a, a step behind. To me, it actually looked like he very reasonably was in preseason form, as in like yeah. physically, he wasn't there yet. I know he's in his early 20s. I know he's really young. But he looks like he was regaining his fitness, which again, it seemed like most players were regaining their fitness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't too worried about that. I mean, he was barely under any pressure from Olat either. So I mean, I, I don't really know if I learned anything. But what I did like very much, like Kessier and Pablo Torre, was his decision making. He was clearly making the right choices and making them quickly. And that's what I did appreciate about Nico's 45 minute performance. And uh, he was the one of any other player in that game that I circled and said, I want to see that more in mm. preseason i want to see more of that and i know xavi does as well because that could again dictate even whether or not he goes out on loan this season uh because mm. if he's going to need more minutes right are we going to reevaluate in january or is he going to immediately carve out the backup position for busquets and then busquets again who played 50 games last season most on the team right yeah he's able to rotate him a bit more and not even rotate him like last season nico was pretty much a super sub but now if he's a super sub coming in for busquets yeah. on more than again 15 to 20 occasions that's going to put you in a much better spot because we do expect again some more physical regression from him and what that means that being Pablo Torre, Frank Cassier and Diego Gonzalez this is really interesting because again you had some 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 uh capital I idiots out there questioning whether or not oh that means that Frankie de Young is being pushed out not necessarily but my question for De Young, it's a difficult one, is that if Frankie De Young, right, if we're seeing Pablo Torre, not say Pablo Torre is better than Frankie De Young, of course, Frankie De Young starting 100 out of 100 times over a 19-year-old Torre. And Kessier, it's a little more complicated because there are two players in their prime, and mm-hmm. Kessier seems like he might be able to do some stuff. Again, it's only against Olat in a preseason friendly, so you can't extrapolate too much of anything. Right. We've seen Frankie De Young do it against so many other players. But is there a world, is there a possibility between Pedri and Gabi and uh, even Kessier that Frankie de Young's skill set doesn't actually fit at the top of the ledge of what Xavi needs to do. Because again, I want to remind people that if he does not, it seems like Manchester United, it's not even seems like, it's been reported. Manchester United have reached a full agreement with Barcelona for Frankie de Young, a package worth 85 million euros. Fee was guaranteed around 75 million plus add-ons. The only person that does not agree to this, Barcelona and Manchester United are saying, all right, fine. Even though his wages are going way up, he's going to be the highest paid player on Barcelona next season as he would be the highest paid on Manchester United next season. Yet both clubs have said, okay, we'll do this deal. Frankie de Young wants to be at Barcelona. I was overjoyed when he chose Barcelona over PSG. He's a player that I wanted to be at Barcelona and he wants to succeed at Barcelona. And the real problem comes is that that is a player. He's going to be paid as a player who cannot lose his spot. He cannot lose his spot Mm -hmm. paid what he's paid. That means you have to play him. And there is this world where, as we saw last season, Maybe he isn't the pick. Maybe he isn't the best option for Xavi's system. While he is an elite world-class player that is going to thrive somewhere else. And that is a really difficult pill to swallow because, again, he dreamed of Barcelona and we dreamed of him playing at Barcelona. 
and it's just it's just it's uncomfortable and weird. And I, I guess the question to me is: Is it possible that he loses his spot? Is it possible? Because no, it seems like the number says absolutely not. So I mean, I, yeah, I I don't think so. The short answer to does he lose his spot? Initially, I would say no. I mean, I think for for the variety of reasons you said, some of them financial, some of them. I don't know. I mean, even kind of tied to, you know, some of them, I guess, almost like even like pride based, you know, where Chavi wants to, because I do get the sense that Chavi wants to work with this guy and get, kind of yeah. unlock this magic from, you know, within him. And then you have the club just going, you know, the, from the admin side, you know, there's, and I know it wasn't even, you know, necessarily this regime that brought him in, but you don't want the guy that you paid you know, this, you know, mega bucks transfer that you brought in who was supposed to be, you know, some heir apparent to Croy for whatever. And, um, you know, you don't want to kind of wash your hands of him and uh, kind of walk away from that, you know, in, in such a way. So I do feel like, I feel like from everyone's perspective, there's at least a motivation to give it a chance, to give it sort of a, a real college try for this to work. Mm-hmm. I mean, De Young obviously wants it to work. Chavi would love it to work, you know, and, uh, you know, that being said, I mean, the, the midfield is very crowded down. And, you know, how it, this is one of the things that can sometimes be irritating with situations like this. So, also, I mean, how long can you really dedicate to seeing if it's working? And this is all kind of aside from the fact that, you know, he might be in Manchester and, you know, in a week's time. But, if we assume that somehow, you know, he, his kind of force of will overcomes the, the deal that's already been struck by the two teams, I think he gets a chance. I think he, some of it, like you said, it is financial. I mean, he, they paid a lot to bring him here. They're paying a lot to keep him here. And so you ideally want that to pay off. I mean, he's not at the sort of, he's not a player who you kind of put in the unfortunate sunk cost category, but he's a very expensive player that you would like to have work out. But if it turns out he's not right for Chavi's system, then I feel like it could get very awkward. Well, I think too, where we'll say the moving parts here, if he doesn't leave, I don't mm-hmm. see how Barcelona have a path forward to afford Kunde, which to me right. means that if, that if Xavi does still want to switch to a three, four, three, which again, Ola preseason friendly, he, they've been a few days in training. So he's going to go with the system, the four, three, three, mm-hmm. the players, especially the ones from the Academy know mm-hmm. well, right. He's not going to switch it up on a bunch of Academy kids that we'll talk about in a second. Mm-hmm. He's going to go with that system. But if he does plan on moving to a three, four, three this season, again, with Frankie de Young, if he refused to go, meaning you don't have Kunde, Yeah. I, I honestly think that you might see him experiment with the young back at a center back spot because mm-hmm. It just makes sense with him in a three at the back and where he may not be shining as the pivot for Busquets. That may not be his role, but in yeah. that, that three, four, three, you still have one of those pivots. And I know they say, Oh, then he becomes a double pivot back there, but I'm not necessarily so sure about that. I, I don't know exactly what they would do, right? Is it Nico and Kessier who would be your double pivots or Busquets and Kessier are your double pivots. And then you have, or, or Busquets and Nico who knows, right. And then you have your three at the back and some combination of mm-hmm. Araujo and then fill in the other two with Frankie de Young. So is it PK? Is it Christensen? Is it yeah. Eric Garcia? Right. I mean, cause ideally there you're talking, it's probably Christensen because PK yeah. may not ever be healthy and Eric Garcia does get to be the rotation piece that he probably is. Also, the rotation piece that I said I, I said on Tuesday that he's being paid as, right? And that's what he he be become. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that would actually be a good scenario. I mean, yeah. So I, I just I want to keep our minds open to I want to almost close our minds to the idea of Frankie Young being gone. Like I'm really not sure. Like with these clubs pushing him as hard as they are, is there some point where he agrees to it? But I mean, again, Barcelona's only path forward financially is is selling him. I mean, right? I had said from the start that. This was financial, and I'm talking myself into how it can be sporting. But again, it's still the Frankie Young business still winds up being financial.